Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are now ready to, to start. Uh, it's a uh, uh, very, very good to see everybody. Uh, this is a seminar hosted by the Network for Oratory uh, and Politics, which is a, uh, a network based at Glasgow University, uh, although spreading its links to uh, Edinburgh and St Andrews uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, we have a uh, paper presented here uh, in Edinburgh, uh, uh, hosted by the Network for Oratory and Politics once a year. Uh, and so today, today is the, uh, the 2016 uh, uh, lecture, uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our, our speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor Mike Edwards uh, of the University of Roehampton. Uh, and uh, Professor Edwards is a Professor of Classics uh, and Head of Department at Roehampton, uh, and he's also uh, has a huge administrative responsibilities because he is uh, head of, of several schools there, uh, and uh, so has a very uh, uh, heavy administrative uh, uh, managerial responsibility uh, as well as his responsibilities in classics. Uh, he is also president uh, of the uh, International Society for the History of Rhetoric, uh, and uh, his uh, specialisms are primarily, uh, primarily uh, the Attic Orators uh, and Greek Rhetorical Theory, uh, but he also uh, has written uh, extensively on ancient biography uh, and on Latin poetry. Uh, he has uh, a dozen or so books uh, either published or, or in press, uh, uh, including uh, editions and commentaries on uh, a number of different uh, Attic orators. Uh, he has, has, has uh, books uh, on, on Plutarch and on Statius and Claudian. Uh, he has three uh, major uh, current projects uh, all of which I think are leading to uh, books to be published uh, next year, uh, uh, at least according to your, your website, uh, they're scheduled to come out next year. There's a, 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 a Greek rhetorical manuals project, uh, which is leading to a commentary on pseudo homogenes uh, program Nasmata. Uh, there is uh, an OCT uh, of uh, Isis, uh, and there is a commentary uh, on Eschines three. So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Edwards to uh, Edinburgh today. Uh, and uh, in this lecture, uh, he will be uh, uh, talking to us uh, on the subject of From Indentio to Actio, Some Thoughts on Greek and Roman Rhetorical Theory and Practice. Thank you. <clears throat> you should wait till you've heard it. <laughs> yes. Um, that way? Or that way? Um, does that make it better? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Dominic, for a typically generous welcome. Um, yes. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you'll applaud me at the end if you're still awake. <laughs> um, it's actually a, a, a delight and a great honour for me to speak to you this evening at the Distinguished Edinburgh Classics Research Seminar. Uh, I know it's this week in the guise of the Network for Oratory and politics. So I thank uh, Henrietta van der Blom for inviting me and for, to Dominic for hosting me. As Dominic said, I'm currently the president of the International Society for the History of Rhetoric, and I hope that some of you at least will be able to come to the conference in London next July. And standing here, I'm reminding reminded of my first ISHR conference, which was held in Edinburgh in 1995. The president then was Peter France, who I'm sure some of you will know, uh, now Emeritus Professor of French here. And I remember emailing him, yes, I think we did have email by then, um, just to ask if a paper on classical Greek oratory 
would be welcomed by that conference. I did not know at the time that the classical rhetoricians had a smallish but distinguished group within the Isha conference, including scholars like Michael Gagarin, Bob Gaines and Harvey Eunice on the Greek side, Chris Craig, Jim May, Yarp Visser on the Latin side, that's where I met them all. Uh, that group has grown exponentially over the years and it's a similar story, I think, with the study of ancient oratory. Edinburgh, as you all know, has had its Regius Chair of Rhetoric and English Literature since 1762 and Hugh Blair. And I recall that Peter France was the incumbent when he was president of Isha. So there's no mention of this in his British Academy biography. So perhaps my memory is failing. But I note that the web page of the current incumbent, Greg Walker, sadly only mentions rhetoric in his title. Um, although he's obviously very distinguished as a professor of English literature. Going back a few years, Douglas McDowell at Glasgow and Stephen Usher at Royal Holloway were flying the flag for the orators when I took my PhD in 1982. Um, and there are some others, but I do not recall there being a great deal of interest in the Attic orators at the time. Rather the opposite. As for Cicero, when Stephen Usher and Malcolm Wilcock retired from the University of London, my memory, which again may be faulty, is that there was for a time no one teaching the Cicero special subject paper in the University of London. And indeed, when I asked Malcolm Wilcock if he would be interested as editor of the Aris and Phillips series in a commentary on a speech of Cicero, he said there would be no demand for it. O tempora, O mores. I'm glad things have changed through the efforts of scholars like Douglas Cairns and Dominic Berry and Mirko Cannavaro here at Edinburgh. And I think we can say that the study of oratory is now mainstream, I reckon. I would this evening uh, I, I wish to give you some examples of how training in oratory was put into practice in Greco-Roman antiquity, basing the talk on the five parts or canons of rhetoric. So you can follow these on the, ha the, the handout is basically a printed version of this presentation with a bibliography. So you can follow either or neither. Invention, heuresis, inventio, was of course the first of the five parts. I've been working for over 12 years now on the Oxford text of Isaiah that Dominic mentioned in his introduction. And he will be the focus, Isaiah, not Dominic, of my Greek examples. As you know, Isaiah's surviving speeches all concern inheritance cases. There's plenty of invention in them, both in the ancient sense of the word, discovering the necessary arguments, and in the modern sense of making it up. Isaiah, whom modern scholars of Athenian law regularly regard as the orator who comes closest to being a legal expert, <clears throat> because of his concentration on these complex inheritance cases, clearly has a thoroughgoing knowledge of the inheritance laws in particular. I forgot my one of these. Um, in what is the most complex of the cases we have, Isaiah 11 on the estate of Hagnias, the speaker, one Theopompus, does that work? No. Yeah, Theopompus, um, has successfully claimed the estate of the long deceased Hagnias, that's this one, um, against a woman called Philomache. That one. 
um, who claimed to be Hagnias' first cousin once removed on his father's side by being the granddaughter of another Philomache. Up there. Um, the sister of Hagnias' father, Polymone. Don't worry about the complexities of this. Theopompus, however, satisfied a panel of jurors that the elder Philomache was not a legitimate sister of Polymon. Consequently, the younger Philomache was Hagnias's second cousin once removed through her great-grandfather Eubulides. It took me weeks to work all this out. <laughs> and others, I suspect. <laughs> um, uh, Eubulides was the brother of Hagnias' grandfather, Hagnias. Um, male names in Greek families skipped a generation, so the eldest son was named after his paternal grandfather, making life difficult for scholars 2,000-odd years later. Therefore, Theopompus the Younger, uh, the, sorry, the, the younger Hagnias' second cousin, was his closest relative, and he secured the estate. However, Theopompus had allegedly done a deal with his deceased brother Stratocles that he would give half the estate to Stratocles' son. And he was now being prosecuted for maltreatment of an orphan by another of the boy's guardians. And Isaiah wrote Theopompus' defense speech um, in which he argues that the law of succession of collateral relatives, which distinguished close from more distant relatives, defined close relatives as being relatives as far as children of cousins. The legal problem is that the Greek word for cousin, anepsios, covered what we would call first cousins and second cousins. But it's not clear whether the phrase children of cousins means children of first cousins, that is, first cousins once removed, or of second cousins, i.e. children of a parent's first cousin. And it doesn't matter about this. But Theopompus was Hagnias' second cousin. And so if children of cousins in the law means first cousins once removed, he was outside the legal degree of kinship. But we know from a later speech in the Demosthenic Corpus, 43 against Macartatus, that Theopompus won. And his own son, Macartatus, may also have won a subsequent case on this basis. So that is how the jurors in this case were persuaded by Isaeus to interpret the law. It's clear that the son of Theopompus' brother, Stratocles, i.e. Theopompus' nephew, being the son of a second cousin, must have been outside the legal degree of kinship. But the argument of Theopompus' opponents will have been that Stratocles was equally entitled to inherit as his brother Theopompus, though he had not established his claim before his death. And so his son should have inherited Stratocles' share of the estate. And this is indeed what later happened with Theopompus' son, Macartatus. But the jurors found in Theopompus' favour. Modern legal scholars have disputed whether Theopompus' argument